Welcome to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, where for 33 years we have engaged the public in reflection and dialogue on the key issues of our day from an ethical perspective. We invite those of you who are listening on Minnesota Public Radio to visit us in person. All forums are free and open to the public, and information on upcoming forums can be found online at westminsterforum.org. You can like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter as well. My name is Tim Hart Anderson. I'm the senior minister at Westminster Presbyterian Church, located on Nicollet Mall in beautiful downtown Minneapolis, and moderator of the forum. It's my pleasure to introduce our guests for tonight's forum conversation on world hunger and agricultural sustainability. Howard G. Buffett is the chairman and CEO of the Howard G. Buffett Foundation, a private family foundation working to eradicate food insecurity and improve the standard of living for the world's most impoverished and marginalized populations. He has traveled to 130 countries to document the challenges of meeting the food needs of our global population while preserving the world's, the world's biodiversity. He actively farms 1,500 acres in central Illinois and oversees three foundation-operated research farms located in Arizona, Illinois, and South Africa. His book, 40 Chances, Finding Hope in a Hungry World, chronicles the people, places, and experiences that have shaped his view of the role of philanthropy in relieving the persistent challenge of global hunger. His son and co-author, Howard W. Buffett, is a lecturer in international and public affairs at Columbia University, where he teaches management techniques for improving the effectiveness of foreign aid and global philanthropy. He's a trustee of the Howard G. Buffett Foundation and previously served as its executive director. He has worked in the U.S. Department of Defense, overseeing agriculture-based economic redevelopment programs in Iraq and Afghanistan, and like his father, he also is a farmer, operating a 400-acre no-till farm near Omaha, Nebraska. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, the Buffets, Howard G., the elder, and Howard W., the younger. You didn't start out life as a farmer, yet you describe yourself as an avid farmer, a passionate farmer even. How did you become one? Well, it's, it's, it's a bit of a long story, so I'll give you the short version. Um, my mom always said I didn't have enough Tonka toys when I was little, so <laughs> I got big and I got bigger toys. Um, but I've always loved equipment, I've always loved being outdoors, and so I kind of found my way going down that path. And I did think I was going to have a rather short career in farming because I had a neighbor who was pretty, pretty patient with me because I wanted to learn a little bit about farming, and he put me on an old 50-20 John Deere tractor and put me out in the field. And, and then one time we were down uh, on a field where, where there were terraces, and it was getting dark, and um, I always like to use the excuse the tractor didn't have very good lights, but um, anyway, I moved up to the next terrace as it got dark, and all of a sudden there was this pickup truck flying up behind me, flashing lights. I'm sure it was honking, but I couldn't hear it. And uh, I stopped, and Wayne Wins gets out, and he says, oh my gosh, how I, he just dissed up my dad's corn. And so I, 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 didn't, I didn't think I had much of a career in farming at that point. Um, but I, I recovered, and um, I, did, I really just, stumbled into it in a way. I mean, I just kept, the more I had exposure to it, the more I liked it, and the more I learned, and it was a challenge, and um, today I've been farming 30 years, and I just love it. Another passion of yours is photography, and your passion for farming and for photography have kind of merged in your interest to alleviate global hunger. Can you describe how that happened? Yeah, I, you know, originally I I started out with photography just on our farm and sunsets and moonrises and animals around the farm and, and, and then eventually uh, I got a little more serious about it and the, the, the most important thing I think about photography and what, what I've done in the last decade or two has just been that it's been a tool. It's been a tool to um, try to prove to people that there are things wrong in the world, um, to put stories with the faces that I've been able to see and bring them home. And one thing the camera's done for me, although it's gotten me arrested in, in some tough spots a few times in other parts of the world, is it's, it's allowed me to go places I would never go. Um, because I want to get photographs that, that really demonstrate the hardship and 
um, the conflict and, and, and the kinds of things that, that are around the world that a lot of people will never really physically get to see in person. And by doing that, the, a, a camera gives you a, a tool to do that. So I probably half the places I've gone in the world I wouldn't have gone if I weren't carrying a camera. Mm -hmm. Can you describe what happens when you take a photograph of an individual in terms of uh, your relationship with that, especially if it's a someone in, in hunger or in pain? Kind of depends if they have a gun or not. But yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I've made that mistake a few times. Uh, so um, it it gives you this unique opportunity to make you feel like there's a separation, and so. Um, it doesn't. It doesn't happen right. Away. I mean, at least for me, it took it took a while, but after after a few years in some tough circumstances in refugee camps and IDP camps and hospitals and places, I, it, it started to give me this uh, a different sense of uh, the ability to, to separate from the subject in a way that, if I'm photographing, I mean, I I can name three places where I photographed young girls that have died within three days of when I photographed them. You don't forget that, and you don't forget their faces, and you don't forget that you couldn't do anything about it. But, you know, it allows you to take a subject and, and treat it a little bit differently. And maybe it sounds even a little callous, but it's, it, it helps you remove part of the, the frustration and, and pain that you're seeing um, because you have another purpose, and your purpose... The introduction in the book talks about um, when I was with a, one of the worst warlords that's ever uh, been on this earth in, 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 in my lifetime and, and an opportunity to interview and photograph him uh, just a few days after he was captured in, in, uh, in, in Sudan. But um, th those things are not easy to do. So you have to have some separation. You have to have some way to, in your mind even, sometimes justify why you're doing what you're doing. And so um, the camera does that, and I don't know how to explain it any other way. It's, 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 it's an amazing tool to be able to bring back the truth of what is happening in the world. On the other hand, uh, you, you do manage to get out from behind the camera. That's the, the power of the stories you tell, people with names, with lives, with mothers or fathers or brothers and sisters. Uh, that's you know that does so much more to the to those of us who who uh, uh, a need to sort of person this thing called global hunger. Uh, you know you could tell us some statistics about global hunger, and it would not move us the way the story of one individual. Well, I think that you know, to me, every statistic has a face now and yeah. many faces. Yeah. You know, if you want to talk to me about hunger and malnutrition, I can tell you about a woman in Angola in 2006 that came up to me and tried to forcefully make me take her child and telling me that if I don't take her child, the child's going to die and the responsibility will be on me. That's, that's something that's really hard. I, I will never forget driving away from that village in the Land Cruiser we were in just feeling just like a truck ran over me. I mean, it's just like I can't do anything and I can't take your child and I can't I can't, I can't save the child. I can't really even do much for this village. And you could look. I, I refer to the village. I, I mean, I got there in the very first, when I looked at the four or 500 people sitting there and the moms in the front with all these young kids, I mean, I, the, the very thought that came into my mind was this is a village of death. I mean, there are just going to be hundreds of people that die. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't stop it. But I had, I had two big lessons from that experience. And one was that I really went into high gear and I was with uh, some great people from World Vision and we went in and figured out what does it take for therapeutic feeding, what does it take to do the analysis, what does it take for the logistics, what does it take for the general food aid, all this stuff. is four and a half million dollars to, to, to probably try to save around 1,500 people. And it all had to come in the right order and you had to have the right people there to assess things and, and it was very complex, very expensive, and then the World Food Program didn't have the food available. And so I realized, okay, it's not going to work. If we want to have an impact, it's not going to work to go village by village, project by project. And because we have the re Now, not everybody has the same resources. So I'm talking about the perspective from our resources. Our resources are big enough that we need to use them in a bigger way. So we have to look at 
not just one village. We have to look at what are the policies? Why, why, why are these people so poor? Why can they not get achieve better agricultural productivity? So now you're talking about advocacy and governance and policy and a whole different array of things that I had no real interest in at the time and no familiarity, but I realized that this is what we had to do. And so it really changed. That was when I started kind of accepting the fact it took me a while, but I mean that you know, we really were going to have to change what we did in our foundation if we wanted to have big impact. Mm -hmm. Howard, how did how did you get engaged in this? You you began traveling with your father as a, as a 12 or 13 year old. Yeah, uh, been to dozens of countries. How did you get involved in in the, the the foundation's interest in alleviating hunger? Well, I mean, it's it's all been thanks to my father and the way that he's included. I me. told him to say that so he could stay in the will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he um, had, I, I don't know what, if it's foresight, I don't know what, I don't know what it was, but he decided he wanted to include me in, in everything that he was doing in his life and to share the experiences and, and exposure to, to uh, frankly, a lot of very difficult things around the world. And we spent these last 15 plus years getting exposed to so many of the stories that we talk about in 40 Chances, but I think most importantly, actually getting exposed to uh, a, a dozens of truly remarkable people who are dedicating their time and their energy and their lives to improving the lives of others. And, and we probably have at least a dozen, if not two dozen stories in 40 Chances about names you've never heard of, that most people have never heard of, who are truly changing the world for others. And, and we won't go into details right now, but, but they're the folks that are our inspiration um, and that I'm so thankful to have met and gotten to know because, because my dad took me with him. Now, when I uh, first got your book, 40 Chances, I assumed it was a biblical 40 because 40 days in the wilderness, 40 days of Lent, you know. Uh, tell us where we, 40 we Chances... We missed that part when we came up yeah. with the title. But. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's, it's a very biblical number, but yeah, uh, no, where, do, where does it come from, 40 Chances? I was uh, uh, bored one Saturday afternoon, so I went to this thing that they call Planter's School at our John Deere dealership, and it's supposed to have... A speaker there that helps you learn how to plant better and of course I I yeah I needed the help um, and and so I showed up along with about 40 or 50 other farmers and we were in this the back shop area and and the and the guy starts saying you know you guys really don't think about your profession correctly and I thought that was a pretty bold statement so um, I started listening to him and he said you know you think about you plant you spray you fertilize you harvest and, and then you roll into the next year and everything just keeps going it's like one cycle after another he said you really need to think about it a little differently by the time your dad lets you climb on the tractor to learn how to plant and you start planting by the time you climb off and let your son or daughter climb on you've got about 40 crop seasons and and, and it really was actually it really kind of hit me because I thought that's not very many, and I've already wasted at least 10. So, I mean, you know, I need to get to work here. And I, I started farming differently in some ways because I realized that every single, this was one chance, this was one opportunity, instead of just thinking, well, you know, I can, if I mess it up this year, I'll fix it next year. And, and so then I realized, well, you know, life's not much different. You get through um, school and you get a little experience and, you know, you've got 40 or so good, really, primary years to accomplish your goals. So what it did to, for me is, particularly in the foundation, is you've got, you know, this very finite time period. So what does that mean? It means you need more urgency. It means you need to be focused. It means for me that you take more risk because we've spent, how much intellect and how much money and time and effort has been spent on trying to end hunger? I mean, it's huge. And we're not getting it all right. So it means to me you've got to try some things that are different, which means you're going to take some risk and you're going to fail, and that's okay to fail. And I think part of our problem in philanthropy is we just don't want to fail. We want to be successful. We need to look like everything we're doing is right and it's going to work. And the truth is it's a complicated world with very complex, difficult problems, and to think that you can go out there and just get them all right, you're never going to get it done. One of the great success stories uh, in, in combating world hunger, of course, was the Green Revolution, uh, credited to Norman Borlaug. Most, you may think of him as a Texas A&M. An Aggie. But you know where he originated. Should we tell well, him? I was, I was hoping Nebraska. Uni <laughs> University of Minnesota, right here. Oh, He's ours. Yeah. That hurt. Uh, <laughs> a gopher. 
We were going to get to the Gopher uh, Husker game if you want to no. go there, <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> there's a reason your microphone wasn't working earlier. <laughs> but. So Norman Borlaug, the, the father of the, the Green Revolution of the 60s that fed a billion people in India and other, other countries, you talk about the Brown Revolution we need. Can you describe what that is? Yeah, the Green Revolution was, you know, this period where um, there was amazing things that happened, and, 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 and Norman Borlaug was, was the, uh, you know, I mean, he's, a, he's really a hero in many ways in terms of how he drove research and, and, and was innovative. And, um, but, you know, in today's world, you know, things change. And um, how he keeps telling me that, because I still use a fax machine. He's trying <laughs> to get me to use a computer. But, you know, some of us are slow. But, um, but it, you know, I mean, things change. And so if you look at the world today, and if you particularly look at Africa, Africa was a continent that is, it has the most weathered soils in the world by far. The glaciers moved off early on, on that continent. And then they've degraded about 75 or 80 percent of their their soils and habitat by by poor management techniques or whatever you want to call them, and um, so if you look at Africa, a green revolution as we know it, as we knew it, as India knew it, um, won't be very effective in Africa for a huge part of the continent. I mean, first of all, Africa is 54 countries; it's not a continent by itself. You have 54 different governments. You have hundreds and hundreds of different growing zones. You have uh, arid, tropical, subtropical, all sorts, some temperate, uh, not much. And so you have all these different complications that don't fit into a Green Revolution model. And um, one of the biggest challenges I think we have is everybody who knows what's worked for them, and in the United States you could call it a Green Revolution model, um, doesn't just transfer to 600 million small farmers that operate on two or three acres that actually consume their own production and have very little ability to enter the marketplace and probably experience, many of them, their families experience hunger periods. So farmers who can't feed their families, that's not our model. That's not what we're good at. That's not what we understand. So we have to think about how do we make Africa look like Africa should look, not how do you make Africa look like we look. And so a brown revolution is all about how do we reclaim soil, soil health, and rebuild uh, what's been damaged uh, on that continent? And, and you have to start, I mean, you know this as well as anyone. I mean, it starts under your feet. I mean, you got to have the foundation. you got to have the belief. you got to have the faith. you got to have, you know, the ability to produce. And it, it doesn't happen and it's just by accident, and it's not going to happen by putting on synthetic fertilizers or hoping that it's going to happen. It's going to happen with a lot of hard work to rebuild a continent that has been uh, destroyed in a lot of ways. Difference between dirt and soil. Yeah, we have this hat called Got Dirt, Get Soil. Um, <laughs> because, you know, it, 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 dirt is something that um, you just walk around on. Soil is something, um, how I, you always say this better than I do. Well, yeah, highly, uh, a tablespoon of highly organic soil has more living organisms than there are people on the planet. I mean, it's that complex. So if you think about that, it, I mean, this is biological activity. This is life. Someone once came up to me and said, well, now all you got to do is put fertilizer on it. And I said, well, there is such a thing as dead soil. Dead soil just means you don't have the micro, uh, you know, activity, microbiology, uh, biological activity to make everything work right. And no, no, you just put fertilizer on it. It's just like real estate, you know, it's a location, 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 fertilizer, fertilizer, fertilizer. And I'm like, wow, okay, where do you get that one? And, um, and, and I said, well, that's like putting an oxygen mask on a cadaver. I mean, you know, it's just, I mean, <laughs> and so, you know, and he's still trying to think about that when I left. But, um, <laughs> but, but I have not seen that work, but I, I don't know. Um, I, I, I just think that, that people have to realize that, you know, um, there have been great civilizations in history that have gone down because they destroyed their soil and they couldn't feed their people. I mean, that's a fact. And so this is not rocket science. This is like learning from past mistakes, and we just haven't learned it very well. Now, some, sometimes it's not a matter of learning. In Africa, in a huge case, it's a matter of those farmers have no option. You know, they don't, they don't have a choice. They're trying to feed their family. They're going to make the... I mean, someone wants them to be... You know, no one will starve to save a tree. And there's not a more true single statement. And so it isn't like they set out to destroy something. They don't have options. And so one of the biggest 
I'll, one more real quick thing. There's a guy in the book, Jake Herman, who we talk about a little bit. And we're so used to defining poverty by economic terms. And so we say, well, the World Bank says it's $1.25 a day or it's $2 a day. And it's some economic term. What Jake says is I define poverty by how many choices people have. And that's a really better way to look at it. I was in Democratic Republic of Congo a few years ago, and we were meeting with coffee farmers that we were working, or cocoa farmers, actually, cacao farmers that we were working with. And this guy says to me, you know, um, when I started in this project, they told me I was earning living, living on a dollar a day. And he said, now that I'm selling cacao, cocoa to... Joe, who Joe Winnie, this guy who's with us, uh, who's in the book too, um, I, they tell me I make six dollars a day. He says, I don't know whether I make a dollar a day. I don't know whether I make six dollars a day. He says that doesn't mean anything to me. What means something to me is before I couldn't feed my kids every day. Hmm. I couldn't send my kids to school. Today I can do it. So it, you know, we always we, we're so it's so easy for us to think about poverty or certain things and always putting it into economic terms. But if your kids are starving and dying, you don't care whether you're making a dollar a day or five dollars a day. You just mm -hmm. care about how do I fix the problem. You also don't care about whether you're encroaching on a forest to mm -hmm. get to exactly. the land. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Howard, you're a no-till farmer. You're, you're concerned about what you do to the soil as a farmer. Could you describe what no-till agriculture is? Yeah, although, I mean, I have to first and foremost say that, I mean, I'm taking after my dad on that. You know, I had the benefit of seeing a few dozen of his chances go by and observing, you know, yeah. it's true. Boom, just like that. <laughs> yeah. Where'd and, they go? Uh, <laughs> I've only been farming for about three or four years now, and so I was able to, I guess, leapfrog uh, a lot of things, and, and we started in with no-till, which means you don't turn over the soil uh, at any point during the year, and so you, you use a no-till planter that deposits the seed directly in through the old crop's cover that's left sitting on top of the soil. And there's a lot of other things we do that are critical for conservation-based farming. We use cover crops, which are crops that you don't harvest. You, you plant them, you let them grow, and then they die, uh, ideally on their own during a, a winter frost. And then that organic matter breaks back down and improves your soil content over time. Um, and then we also do a lot with nutrient management. And this last year was my first year putting on fertilizer through my center pivots, which is a, a highly more efficient way of doing it and a better timed release as well. So we've looked at a, a, a number of specific practices that are really critical for uh, conservation or biological-based farming. And um, one thing that gets me excited, though, is the government now actually has a conservation program called the Conservation Stewardship Program. And so for the first time, I think since 2008, they're actually contracting with farmers. This is not a subsidy, this is a contract with a farmer where if the farmer takes on specific conservation-based activities, they'll get reimbursed for those costs, dollar to dollar, sometimes a little bit more. And so I get about $37 an acre in value from the government in order to implement specific conservation-based activities, which gets me excited because that means that our government is now placing an actual dollar value on what it means to preserve and improve your soil, your water quality, and your air. And, and to me, that, that's exciting because we'll have those metrics that we can use going forward to incentivize even better behavior from our, from our farmers. Let's talk about global con conflict. You, you, the foundation seems to have a, a kind of a, an adventuresome spirit. You, know, you go places where most people would never dream of going. Uh, can you describe the relationship between global conflict and global hunger? Hunger creates conflict, and conflict creates hunger. You cannot separate them. I, I, uh, um, I think I think probably the reason why we work in the places we work, which would be South Sudan and Burundi and DRC and Central African Republic and Sierra Leone and Liberia and those places, is because um, I just feel like we should be able to take the risk to go into those places and try things other people may not want to try. You're never going to get a government agency, USAID, or anybody else to go in and, and do very much in a conflict area. And I think one of the things we learned, and this is in, in Eastern DRC, we're trying something very different. Um, and, and it's required a lot of time and effort. I mean, it's taken a lot away from the other things we've done because you have to show up and you have to show up often and you have to build relationships. So we work with the President Kabila and Kagame and Museveni and we meet with uh, farmers and uh, tribal leaders and everybody uh, to try to figure out the solutions. And we kind of came to this conclusion a while back that, that maybe we could use our development efforts to actually help create peace 
rather than waiting for peace to be created so then we can rush in and try to fix everything. So we'll invest 40 some million dollars this year just in North Kivu, and he's the one province, um, probably do the same next year. And it's total risk capital, but we're building, uh, we're funding the largest infrastructure project in, in the province that'll bring electricity to 130,000 people. We're funding road projects and water projects. So uh, the M23, the big rebel group, one of them that has been the biggest focus recently just uh, surrendered in the last uh, two days. And um, they're the group we used to meet with regularly because they controlled the area where we work. And so if you look at that, um, we have an instant demobilization. I mean, you know, instead of waiting until something happens and scrambling and trying to figure it out, we thought, well, let's, let's do it the other way. So we'll see what happens in a few years. But um, our effort is to give people hope. We learned this in Afghanistan. I mean, you ha when people are under, this, this is a place where over five to six million people have died in the last decade or so. This is a place where if you're a mother, you likely don't think, is my daughter going to get raped? It's when is she going to get raped? Now think about that. Every day you walk outside of your home and you don't know you're not safe. You don't know what to expect. You're fearful. I mean, this is how people live, millions of them. And so, you know, it's absolutely not right. And so we felt like, could we participate in this differently so that we could try to use our dollars and our efforts to bring peace rather than, than, than be kind of a solution to it later? So... You know, those parts of the world are the places where um, I think we do best, and, and a lot of people wouldn't want to be there, and a lot of people aren't there, but it, it's just, it's a natural place for us to be. You mentioned Afghanistan, a place where our government is militarily. Uh, a lot of the work you've done is through the Department of Defense, which finds itself doing things other than uh, fighting wars, but attempting to uh, cultivate crops and, and build infrastructure. Can you describe how effective the Department of Defense well, let me, is at I, that? I'm going to tell you a little story. I, I actually, you're asking me a question I've not, this will give me a chance to get in trouble. Um, uh, and then I'm going to let Howie answer because he really has a lot of experience with it. But what was interesting is is they put together this, this uh, task force, which is the one Howie worked for. And um, what I found interesting is that, and this is what I talk about taking risk. And I realize you have taxpayers and uh, transparency and accountability and all these things you have to do. But in Afghanistan, you're going to go up and see, you know, basically a tribal leader. I got to tell you, there's no ATM machine around, okay? There's no, can I write you a check? There's no, you know, so you have guys going up there with $100,000 in cash. But they're going up there because they're going to talk about how they're going to build a school. They're going to talk about how they're going to get them food. They're going to talk about whatever it is that that community leads, needs. And, and there's only one way to do it. But it's a very unconventional way. So the reason the task force eventually pretty much got down to nothing is because people couldn't handle that process. So we have an inherent conflict in, in, in how we do business and how the rest of the world does business in those kinds of circumstances. It's not, it's not easy. I mean, we have some other ideas on, you know, I mean, you can use cell phones today to do certain things, and, you know, and, and, but, but it, it's a difficult thing because you, you have to go to them and relate to them the way that they want to solve the problem. And you don't show up in the middle of some province in Afghanistan and say, here's your credit card. I mean, it just doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So it's been a challenge, but, but how I should just talk for a minute about it, he has more hands-on experience than I do. Well, fortunately, I never had one of those bags of cash. Um, <laughs> That's what he says now. <laughs> yeah, no. You know, Afghanistan's an amazing place. And, and I think uh, one thing that, that gave me hope but also frustrated me a little bit after our first trip went there was that um, public perception, particularly back here in the United States, um, is incredibly skewed towards war, destruction, bombings, death, uh, and it's very dark, uh, and it's a very one-sided perspective. I think the media has really um, characterized Afghanistan. And, and when we got our, our first trip there on the ground and then subsequent trips after that, you know, we began to really learn about the community, what their needs were, the kinds of people that they were. We met with farmers. You know, these are farmers who, who had no interest in growing poppy you know, and, and, and creating opium and telling us that they, they hated the fact that in their previous years they were growing a substance that was addicting youth to a drug. I mean, they, they really dis disdained it. But one of the other interesting things we learned is that 
drug lords, ironically, are incredibly effective at value chains. And that's what we, in terms of illicit, uh, illegal crop, that's what we struggle to create all over the world. But when you're a drug lord, you have a lot of advantages. So in the case of growing opium or poppy in Afghanistan, the drug lords would show up at a farmer's doorstep, they would hand them a seed, they would pay them upfront for the crop, they would protect them throughout the year and check in and make sure they were doing things right, and they would come and collect the crop after it had been harvested and everything was said and done. It was a piece of cake. Those are all different services that we find incredibly hard to build or develop or sustain in all different parts of the world. And yet, you know, these guys are the bad guys on the ground who've got it figured out to a T, unfortunately. And so, you know, there was a lot of interesting lessons to learn from that. And then, of course, we focused on how do we actually create the ecosystem for uh, growing saffron and growing pomegranates and rebuilding wheat growing and pistachios and raisins, crops that Afghanistan was once a global leader in producing before poppy, um, uh, poppy even existed in the country 30-some years ago. So we, we had some very unique experiences there that I think, at least for me, adapted out to how we wanted to approach value chain development in a lot of places around the world. And yeah, we, I mean, we really drew a lot from that. Mm -hmm. I, I like the cash option. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. That was a joke. <laughs> You're listening to the Westminster Town Hall Forum, broadcast from Westminster Presbyterian Church on Nicollet Mall in downtown Minneapolis. I'm Tim Hart Anderson, Senior Minister of Westminster Presbyterian Church and moderator of the forum. We're delighted to welcome to the Town Hall Forum authors and philanthropists Howard G. Buffett and Howard W. Buffett. While the ushers collect questions from the in-house audience, I'd like to invite the radio audience to join us at Westminster Church at noon on Thursday, November 21st, when neurosurgeon Dr. Eben Alexander will discuss proof of heaven, the nature of human consciousness. Visit our website, westminsterforum.org, for more information on our upcoming events. The Buffett name is synonymous with investment success. How is your work fighting global hunger akin to successful market investment? You know, that's a great question because... Um the truth is a market system works with a certain amount of efficiencies that when you don't get things right, somebody loses a job or someone votes you out or something happens. Philanthropy is a little bit the opposite, and I think it's one of the things that we really have to try to change, which is um, as long as you can raise money, as long as you can convince people that what you're doing is worthwhile, you can continue with a bad idea for a long time. <laughs> and and it's true. And and so, you know, I, I have the easiest job, well, it's not that easy, but I have an easier job because as long as I don't have my dad mad at me, I'm getting my money for the foundation. And, and, as, <laughs> and as long as the IRS doesn't think I did something wrong, then I, I've got incredible freedom incredible freedom to do things. And so that freedom is something that I think I have an obligation to use. Um, but we, I, I think, so I think what the dynamics of both, you know, the, are very different. And so it's up to us to challenge donors and to challenge ourselves and to, to challenge NGOs to to be willing to have a little different mindset and a little set a little different paradigm so that everything doesn't have to be successful. That you know we can we can fail. And we can try new things, and th and that's what isn't very evident in philanthropy because everybody wants to feel like their money was well spent. They want to feel like you know we had the success. We feel good about it, mm -hmm. and you can feel good about failure. You just have to know why, and mm -hmm. and and you actually can. So I think it, it's the dynamics are so different. I would say the most common thing that they have uh, together is that our our biggest focus is we invest in people. And so just like my dad would tell you that the success of Berkshire is investing in good managers in all the different businesses that Berkshire has, I would say our, the success that we have and the hope that we have is in investing in the, the investment that we put into people. Let's talk a bit about corruption. You've, you've probably experienced a good deal of it as you travel around the world. How, how, uh, uh, how much an op of an obstacle is corruption to making progress in fighting world hunger? Well, corruption's huge. Um, there's probably, it's hard to boil it down to one or two things, but between land ownership and corruption, those are probably the two biggest uh, of the five biggest impediments that, that we would run into. And, you know, we have a story in, in the book about um, Tony Blair 
and what he's doing with his African Governance Initiative, AGI. And we learn the hard way that you can do a lot of good things on the ground and they can absolutely um, pretty much not last because you've got somebody that will take advantage of it, take it away, uh, change the rules. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when a few people have power and they can exercise that power over a lot of people, um, nothing works well. Mm -hmm. If you look at a lot of countries in Africa, um, and it's not, when I say it, I mean, there's, we've got lots of problems here too, but um, when you look at Africa where we do a lot of our work, there's, there's a very strange dynamic because if I have diamonds or cobalt or oil, um, I can make, as a leader of a country, I can, I hate to use the word leader, the person who's in charge, um, can, can actually make a deal with somebody and become very wealthy, uh, protect their interest, uh, protect their power, um, and you do that by taking care of some of the generals and some of the other, you know, the judges and whatever. Uh, there's plenty of history that goes with it to tell you how you do it. And um, they don't need my vote if I'm out there. And they don't need my taxes. So it, there's no system that demands accountability and no system that demands transparency. In fact, I'm, I'm at an advantage if I keep people fragmented and poor, illiterate, they, they're not going to. They're not going to join up against me. They're not going to understand as well what I'm doing, mm -hmm. and um, so the dynamics of what corruption does is it just undermines everything, and it's a huge problem, and it's probably the biggest single impediment to success in Africa. Mm -hmm. You mentioned Tony Blair and your work with Tony. Is uh, he's a good friend of mine. That's why I call him Tony. You can call him Tony. <laughs> Former Prime Minister Tony Blair. Uh, you know, I you, call him something else after he ran my corn down yeah. <laughs> in my combine. <laughs> How effective is a, is a former leader like a Tony Blair, or for that matter, a, a celebrity or an entertainer like a Bono or Shakira, in, in really getting significant work done and alleviating global hunger? I think it, it can make a difference. Uh, I will tell you that, that Tony is so committed to this and so passionate about it um, he, I, he's, he's, to me, he's one of the most hopeful people I know because I think he will change things. I, I, I think he has changed things and he cares about doing it and he can stand toe to toe with the prime minister or president and he's done it. He's been there. He knows what the problems are. And more importantly, he knows how, what the solutions are in government. And, um, and when you're talking about the solutions, I'm not talking about the sophisticated, complicated stuff. And I'm not talking about whether you're deciding whether you go to war with, you know, the United States and Afghanistan or something. I'm talking about how do you make a government function? I mean, if you go to Rwanda, you know, stuff just happens like this, okay? It, that, that country works, okay? You go next door to the Democratic Republic of Congo, it is not functional. Now, there's something that makes a difference between those two countries. And that difference is the ability to understand, you know, the important things you put in place. I mean, I can tell you, I've been, uh, when I go see President Kagame, I show up, he's there, I see him, things happen. When I go to see other presidents, I won't name them, but I have showed up before at a presidential palace. Um, no one has my name on the list. The appointment's been made. They tell me to go back for the hotel for a couple hours. They'll call us later, and then they call us later, and then we come back, and then they can't find my name on the list, and it's, it starts all over again. I spend a whole day trying to see the president, and eventually I might see him. But, I mean, you know, people don't, if you're trying to attract business and you're trying to create jobs and you're trying to, you know, build infrastructure, you don't sit around and you say, there's easier places to do this. I don't need to beat my head against the wall. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it, it is a huge challenge. And um, I, I just feel like somebody like Tony is, has the ability to, to walk in there and analyze it and make suggestions. And, and the one thing really important about it is he does not go to a country, obviously, where he's not invited. And so, you know, the president or someone, the prime minister has to say, we would like your help. Mm -hmm. And then he comes in and he actually integrates really good, well-talented people into the government to work side by side mm -hmm. and make some changes. Let's talk about climate change. What's the connection between climate change and global hunger, if any? Well, I'm not a scientist, first of all, so I'll make well, that then, disclaimer. Then why don't you ask Howard to answer the question? Ah, <laughs> no. <laughs> that makes That's a really good idea. That's what I would do. So, Howie, what do you think? 
Well, I'll, say, I'll let you off the hook. Um, we, you look, all I have to do is tell you what's happened to me in the last 10 years on my farm in, in Illinois, and I can tell you something's not as normal. I have no idea what climate change really amounts to, and I don't know if it's part of a 200-year, 2,000-year cycle, but I do know this. We have spewed a lot of stuff into the air in this world. We have cut down a lot of trees in this world. We have uh, destroyed a lot of water quality and soil quality. I, I absolutely have to believe that those actions have contributed to a decline in our environment. And if part of that is climate change, and that's what it is. Um, but to me, what I know is that, that a lot of small farmers will be affected by it. We've done, you know, you can do modeling, and modeling is only as good as the information you put in it. But if you, if you look, we did this in Central America. If you take some of the areas in Central America and you put in the current temperatures and you change those temperatures, um, you know, by three degrees or five degrees, you can start to see what happens to your ability for crop production. And it's going to hammer small, it's ar it already has in some places. I mean, it just hammers small farmers. And what are their options? You know, it's like all, you go to Nicaragua and Guatemala and Honduras, I mean, every piece of that country is accounted for, for somebody's got it using it, okay? So it isn't like, well, I'll move up the mountain, you know, 30 feet so I can grow better coffee. It's not, it doesn't work that way. So, you know, I think climate change or however you want to define it, uh, it, it, it will have some net positive in some places. Uh, in fact, Minnesota could be a net positive. If your climate warms, you will have a lower, longer growing period as long as you don't run out of water. Um, but you know, in, in many places, particularly where there's poor farmers and in different climates other than temperate climates, uh, it could be a very net negative thing for farmers. Uh, Howard, when you began farming, you chose to do no-till uh, agriculture. What about organic? Did you consider doing organic agriculture? Uh, not at the scale that we have, at least at 400 acres, and we also, uh, at least in, in the farm in Nebraska, don't have the ability right now to be managing livestock. And so, uh, at the time, no, it hasn't been a viable option for us that we've considered. Is organic farming a, a, a way that world hunger might be addressed? Well, Howard can answer, my dad can answer this a lot better than I, I can. I knew he was going to do that to me. <laughs> but... <laughs> But I think through necessity, you're going to have, I mean, this is, this is what my, I'm just, I'm stealing his words here, to be honest. Through necessity, most farmers in Africa will, will be primarily biologically based or organic based because they have to be. They don't have many options. Mm -hmm. You don't think world hunger, hunger can be solved by organic farming on a massive scale? Oh, I think it's going to take every bit of, every kind of farming and every farmer that can do it the best that works for them. So I think the most important thing is to give farmers options and choices and uh, most small farmers don't have those choices today. And so uh, Howie's correct in terms of my assessment that um, there'll be tens of millions of farmers in, in Africa that will be organic, not by choice, not because there's some great thing about being organic because they get some certification and they get more money for it or anything mm -hmm. else like you do here. Um, they're going to be organic because they don't, they, they, don't, they, they don't have the access or they can't afford or they don't have the training or whatever it is. So that's one of the things, that's one reason why Green Revolution doesn't just work to replicate it in Africa because those farmers are not going to be high fertilizer users. They're not all going to start out with hybrid seeds. They're not going to all have access to irrigation. So, you know, the things that the Green Revolution was built on don't exist there for those farmers. So they'll be organic by default. And we, we refer to them as biologically, uh, biological farmers because I, I always get concerned because when you think organic, there's a certain you know, characteristic certain impression or, of what organic yeah. is in this country, and that's not what it is over there. You say we need all kinds of farming. Does that include genetically modified foods? Why did I know you were going to ask me that at some point? <laughs> um, I'll tell you, I think that the most important thing about GMOs is, is to really follow the science. And GMO is one of the most polarized debates um, I, in agriculture that I've ever seen. What I know is that... Um, we went into it quickly in this country, but this country is as regulated as any country in the world. Um, and you can debate all day long whether we should have done a better job of that. And I wouldn't debate that we couldn't have done a better job of that, but where we are is where we are, and we can't go backwards on it. So the question is to really understand it as well as we can. 
you know, the thing that's really frustrating for me when we talk about agricultural development, particularly in Africa and Central America, is those are not, there, there's not a farmer I met in Central America or Africa that would benefit from GMOs. Not a single one yet, okay? Now, that doesn't mean someday they might not, but the truth is they are starting at, at, a, at a benchmark so much lower than how we think in this country that th the last thing I would worry about would be getting them GMO seeds. Hmm. I would be worrying about how do you build soil health how do you get cover crops? How do you get either improved open pollinated varieties or better hybrids? And, and, and one of the things that people do in this debate is they, they, they say all hybrids are GMOs, and that's just so untrue. I mean, 10, 50, well, 20 years ago, GMOs didn't exist, and we had great hybrids. So it, it, it gets, it, it's more complicated. It's a hard thing to answer, you know, it, it, simply. But, you know, for the very most important thing is understand the science and understand the implications and I'm the last one that would want to see anything that we do from an agricultural standpoint damage our environment. So I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a tough balancing act. Mm -hmm. The other thing is we need to use, this is important to say, I mean, we need to use all the technology that we can um, to fight hunger. And usually you won't hear me say that because, I, I mean, technology is not going to fix a lot of things in, in, in hunger or agriculture. But we still need to tap into that resource and make sure that what is available and what we feel is safe and what science supports, that we use it. So, you know, there, the worst thing in the whole GMO debate is you get people on each side of it, companies on one side, people on one side, whatever, that just dig their heels in and draw lines in the sand, and now everything has got to be either this way or this way, and you're never going to solve a problem that way. Let's talk about U.S. government policy. Are there one or two changes you would recommend in, in U.S. policy, either in foreign aid or in other kinds of policies that would help uh, significantly reduce global hunger? Yeah, replace the Congress. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> who, who, I, I got to tell you, who would want to run for Congress? That's the problem. I mean, you know, but, but um, yeah, I think, you know, first of all, the farm bill has been debated on and on and on and has never, you know, I don't know when it will ever get done. Um, I think the biggest mistake we've made in our farm bill for years has been that conservation has not been the primary focus and has not been funded like it should be funded. So in that respect, um, you know, taxpayers pay for the farm bill. But taxpayers also have a benefit from a, a great agricultural system that provides choice, diversity, safety, you know, inexpensive food, all those things. So it's not a perfect world, but we, we, it's a lot better than most places in the world in terms of, of how we're able to walk to a supermarket on every other corner and, and have choices so, and afford most of it. So I think you know, the Farm Bill is something that needs to be accountable to the public. And, and the most accountable thing to the public is how do we keep our water clean? How do we preserve our soil? You know, how do we take care of our environment? And all of those things uh, are at the absolute bottom of the list of the Farm Bill and always have been, and they're the very first ones to get cut. So that would be one policy that I would say really needs a lot of work. What about America? You haven't discussed hunger in America. You, what's your foundation doing about that? Boy, I'll tell you what. Um, we're, we're, we're very involved in it now, in the last few years. Um, we work a lot with Feeding America. They have been a great partner. They work in every county across the country. That's one reason why we went partnered with them is because we wanted the scale. But you know, if you if you look if you look in this country, you know we have enough food to feed everybody in this country. It's a matter of distribution, access, affordability, political will is probably the biggest one. Um, it's complicated. I mean, it's not easy. Um, but the truth is, if you can look in Minnesota, and I think the, I, I should have checked this, but I think. It's 18 or 19 percent of the people in, in either Minneapolis or Minnesota are food insecure. You know, that means almost 20 percent of the population doesn't know for sure where their meal is going to come from that day. They don't know that they can feed their kids before they go to bed. There's something really wrong with that in this country. Um, I, 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 it should shock people, but it doesn't. I mean, uh, it does some, but it should really shock people. And we should do better than that. And the truth is, uh, this is where I always say everybody can do something because 
the most effective, and I'm not saying this because I'm sitting here, but the most effective organizations in fighting hunger in this country are, are churches and organizations that, that, that get volunteers and go out and it's meals and wheels and it's serving meals at your, at your soup kitchen and it's, it's, it's volunteering at the food bank. It's doing all these things that, that actually do change lives for people who don't have the same opportunities that we have or the same access to the services that we have. And so in this country, it, I think it's a really serious issue. It's gotten worse over the last four or five years. It used to be about 37 million people. Now it's 50 million people. Obviously, it's related to the economy. Um, there's some of those things we can't do anything about. But I think it's really hard to think about the fact that we have neighbors. Um, I, I'll tell you this quick story um, that uh, we were sitting at Thanksgiving two years ago, and we were talking about this, and my daughter who lives in Madison, Wisconsin, um, she said, wow, you know, I had this really interesting experience about two weeks ago. I accidentally left my garage door up all night, and um, we had two cars in there. There was some money in the cars. There's skateboards and lawnmowers and, you know, bikes and all this different stuff. And she said, you know, the only thing that anybody took was the food out of our ref extra refrigerator. And she lives in a nice neighborhood. I mean, you know, so hunger is everywhere in this country. It's hidden in this country. And I, I think that, you know, when you have... Um, when you have a country like this, it, it should be shameful that we can't feed our population and feed them properly. What in your experience is the role of women and empowering women in alleviating global hunger? Well, I always say that the fastest way and I mean this, the fastest way to see change in Africa is to have at least half of the continent, 25 countries, be led by women. Um, I think that women bring a different thinking process, a different empathy. <laughs> I was very biased because I had a mother that had a strong influence on me. But, um, but I, you know, I think I, boil, I, I can boil it down to the rawest part of what I mean, which is... Um, I've been in a lot of, lot of places where there's starvation and malnutrition, and people have to make really tough choices. And the truth is, in those situations, if, if there's minimal resources, a woman will take care of her family first and better than a man will. Hmm. Now, if you can translate that into politics and policy, uh, and innovation and ideas, which I know you can, then you will see a different kind of leadership. And so um, I don't understand why, I mean, it's taken us a long time in this country to get to where we are, and we still have a long ways to go. But when you go to cultures where, we, we had this experience in Afghanistan where we had done a project where women had uh, access to farmland for the first time on their own, and everybody wanted me to talk to the women. I said, you know, actually, I'd rather talk to their husbands. And we could only find one husband that would talk to me. But we stood there with his wife and the husband, and we, it was all through translation. And he basically what he finally said is, well, now I understand my wife has some value. And I thought, I mean, wow, if I said that to my wife, I mean, you know. And <laughs> so, uh, but but it, it's it's it's... It's a huge mindset shift. I mean, you know, so if, if we go over there in development and we don't even understand how far apart the thinking is on stuff like that, we're never going to get it right. And so um, when, it, when it comes to that, I just think, you know, uh, if you believe that all human beings are created equal and if you believe that all people should have equality and access to equal uh, services and opportunity, then why in the heck have we treated women the way we've treated them? Mm. Now, you've declared that by 2045 you want your foundation to have uh, dispersed all of its resources. W what's the logic behind that? Well, first of all, I hope I'm alive by then, but I doubt I will be. But um, I could do something to arrange that. Or you <laughs> yeah, I, that. <laughs> shut his microphone off. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, you really have two choices. You want to just kind of get it down to the brass tacks, as they say, which is um, I can build, an, I, I, if I wanted to, I could build a billion-dollar endowment, and I could have my grandkids giving money away and 
you know, great. But why would, I, I think, why would I want to do that? Um, the problems are so big today. There are people dying today. There are people hungry today. Why would I, what I, what I, why would I pile up money so that somebody else can give it away in the future? And why would I do that with some, I don't know what my grandkids are going to be interested in. I don't know if they'll even be good at figuring out how to give money away. I, giving money away is not so easy if you want to do it intelligently and you want to have impact. I mean, I've learned that. I've made a lot of mistakes. So, you know, I want to, I, I want to take those mistakes and use them productively with the money now. Um, so I, I don't, I mean, I, I get why people want to build a legacy and they want to do certain things. And there would be people who clearly would disagree with me. But I, I just look at it and I think, all right, I have this ability and this opportunity to use a huge financial resource. Why would I not use it now to try to fix as many problems or address as many problems as I can now? And I have this great fortune also to have several, I have three of my kids that are trustees. And those three kids all bring different skill sets out of the five of them. There's three of them on there. That causes me another problem. But, um, and, um, you know, but they're, they all contribute and, they're, and, and, and they understand different things and they bring value to it. And so why wouldn't I harness that energy and that passion and the interest and the opportunity and do it now? I just, mm -hmm. I, I don't, you know, um, you, don't, you don't sit back and say, well, I think maybe in 20, 30 years I'll try to earn some money. I mean, you know, you're trying to do it now. You want to get it done now. And so I just don't, I, that's how I look at it. We have time for one. F Go ahead. <laughs> time for one final question. Uh, you've been to 130 plus countries. You've seen some awful situations uh, about which you probably can't even speak. It's so terrible. How do you not get overwhelmed by that? How do you hang on to hope? <laughs> Well, there was a long time where I was overwhelmed, to be honest with you, and I think it started partly because when I really started using photography, as I mentioned earlier, as a tool to try to collect images, that's overwhelming. You come home and you, and you just relive what you just saw, and you don't know what you can do about it. So the way that you get hope is you figure out what can you do about it. And um, really, the, the truth is that writing this book, um, probably gave me more hope than any single thing I've done because it forced me to look at what have we done, uh, what have we done well, what have we not done well, but who are the people that I've met? Who are the people that every day make a personal sacrifice to get out there and try to do something better for other people when they don't have to do it or when, when they could do something else for themselves? So um, the book really is about our experiences in terms of I think, in a sense, how, how, how have we found hope? Mm -hmm. Because it's, 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 it's a pretty depressing world in a lot of ways, mm -hmm. and it is pretty overwhelming. The challenges are big. But I would just say that, you know, everybody can do something. you got to show up to do it. Show up, figure it out, use your skills, figure out what it is you can do, and everybody can contribute to help somebody else, and it's not that hard to do. Thank you, Howard G. Buffett and Howard W. Buffett. Thank you. Thank you.